Hi everyone, my name is PJ Haggerty, and I'm here for my talk, Innovation and Iteration, Understanding How We Improve. I work at Spotify on the Developer Experience team. Uh, we have a great portal, developer.spotify.com. You can check it out, play around with the API, do some really fun stuff, um, and I highly recommend it. So that's what I do. Um, I also, I hail from the city of Buffalo, New York. If you don't know where Buffalo is, if you know where Niagara Falls is, we're just south of there. Uh, I love to do karaoke. I coached hockey for a bunch of years. Uh, I love to travel with my wife. I'm in a band and we like to play shows. I also at one point let my 11-year-old keynote a conference. None of which is here what we're here to talk about. So let's get to what we're here to talk about. Many people who watch Westerns and modern takes on the romantic American Western movement, they believe in certain things. The good guys always wore white hats and they always won the day. Everything west of the Mississippi was lawless. Some bank robbers weren't such bad people. And the Pony Express was how we got the mail delivered. To many people, these are facts. Dearly held beliefs that have been allowed to become the stories we build other stories upon. But if we look closely, there's some holes in this story. Some really big ones. Before even the Civil War, some folks decided to head out and seek their fortunes. The United States was trying to achieve a goal called Manifest Destiny, expanding from the East Coast to the West Coast. For some people, this meant opportunity, be it to find farmland, to establish new freedoms, or to find gold lying in the hills across America. When prospectors found gold on the California coast, towns began to pop up all along the coast. It was necessary for people, both companies who owned the land or paid prospectors and their families, the adventurous souls that would go out and try to seek these things out, they had to get the mail somehow, as quickly as possible. These remote locations were growing. Between, nine, or I'm sorry, between 1848 and 1860, the population of California grew to 380,000 people. Now, today, we don't consider that a whole lot. Uh, I think there's more people in like downtown San Francisco on a given afternoon. But back then, that was a lot. With very few ways to get information from one end of the country to the other, a new solution had to be found. Now, you might be thinking, what about the railroads, PJ? That's often what people think immediately right there. What about the railroads, PJ? Well, railroads, they could get messages a good portion of the way across the continent, but they couldn't make it much further than Missouri, which is about somewhere between like one third and half the way. So it's not quite far enough. When the United States gained New Mexico and Arizona as states in 1853, we could only just start to consider bringing the coast together via rail. And let's be honest, the railroad back then was no guarantee of speed or safety. It is kind of like having a server in a closet being maintained by someone with a general idea of how to run Linux or Ubuntu, and making their own Cat5 cables with a crimper, um, all of which were entwined in unsafe ways throughout this whole closet, and the closet had no ventilation. Unsafe, unstable, in the case of the railroads, prone to robbery, the railroad could not be the right answer for a growing country. Add to all of this, this aggravating edge case of a small inconvenient idea about who was doing all this work. While well, some people wanted to bring the country together, others wanted to remain on top while oppressing other human beings. War was on the horizon. If we wanted to continue to be successful and move forward as a country, we needed a way to communicate quickly. On the eve of the American Civil War, the Pony Express was born. A network was built. Riders, generally young, often orphans or escaped slaves, would be hired to ride like the wind. The Pony Express began its ride on April 3, 1860. Suddenly, you get a message from New York City to San Francisco in just 10 days. It was a miracle in modern communication. 10, ten days. Okay, well, it's very fast back then, so you got to put it in perspective. If we've learned anything from the movies about the, that we've seen about the Pony Express, about how ubiquitous and long-lasting it was, it seems every modern Western, past Western, old Western, has some reference to the Pony Express, some person riding into town with a letter in their hand to save the day. There's been movies and television shows dedicated to these brave riders and their horses. Flying across the plains, outwitting dangerous animals, bandits, Native Americans who were kind of upset that we were taking their lands and territories, and rightfully so. The Pony Express, a paragon of innovation in April 1860. However, this great technique for moving messages from coast to coast was outdated after a mere year and a half. 
The needs of the people and the speed of technology overtook these Western riders. So instead of innovation, the Pony Express was really just a stopgap method and would have remained a footnote in American history were it not for the so-called Penny Dreadfuls that raid Pony Express riders to heroic status, along with folks like Billy the Kid and Doc Holliday. A simple device at the right time, a time when war was starting and communication needed to move faster than ever before. All this culminated in the end of the Pony Express after a mere 18 months of operation. As a side note, think of the Telegraph and the Pony Express the next time you have a conversation about machines replacing people. Automation is not a new issue. When's the last time you tipped your your elevator operator? If the Pony Express was a stopgap, how long did the Telegraph last? Funny you should ask, and I'm so glad you brought it up because it really makes this whole conversation move a lot faster. Perhaps you've heard of this British person, sometimes called the father of modern computer science. In World War II, so about 80 years after the Civil War, this guy, Alan Turing, Sir Alan Turing now, was in England trying to decipher telegraph messages that were encoded using the above machine. Known as the Enigma, it was a way to encrypt and decrypt messages sent via telegraph. So if you think encryption is new, we got nothing on that. It's from you know years ago. Some pieces of technology last a long time. Others fade quickly or have limited use and disappear. We see this all the time in the application world. Unless you all plan to share your thoughts on this talk on your Bebo page or live journal, you know what I'm talking about. So, let's take a look at some things and see their lasting power. Maybe we can speculate on what has staying power and what has more of a flash in the pan feel to it. By the way, that is literally an 1849 gold prospecting term. Flash in the pan. Uh, You can use that at your next pub quiz. We'll start with a philosophy lesson. Lesson. Philosophies around technology are not a new phenomenon. Whether it's the idea that mainframe computing is the only true computer science solution, to the idea that DevOps can be certified and assigned as a team. There have never been a shortage of ideologies that accompany the work we do. Most philosophies are really meant as best practices to allow our work to flow easily and produce better applications or run better networks or data centers or whatever on Earth or in the cloud. doesn't really matter. Some are only suggestions because something worked on my machine, so it must work for everyone else. Let's take a look at the most common modern era philosophies and see what the strengths are and where the pitfalls might be. So waterfall, Niagara Falls. You can all see Niagara Falls. Waterfall is probably the most well-known and much maligned development methods in the world today. How many of you have been involved in an organization that's using the waterfall technique? Even if they say they're not doing it, chances are you've been in an organization that's doing the waterfall technique. For those of you who don't know, here's the definition of waterfall. Definition voice. The waterfall model is a relatively linear, sequential design approach for certain areas of engineering design. In software development, it tends to be among the less iterative and flexible approaches, as progress flows largely in one direction, downwards like a waterfall, through the phases of conception, initiation, analysis, design, construction, testing, deployment, and maintenance. Pretty thorough idea for an idea that first was developed in the 1950s. So a mere 10 years after, you know, more or less, Turing was dealing with the telegraph, we're trying to find engineering techniques in computer science. Innovative for its time, though even shortly after people saw the flaws. Waterfall is simple. As our programming teams begin to build applications for business scientific inquiry, we needed to establish a way to do it in an organized way. Is it in any way surprising that the first thought was to take a page from modern manufacturing techniques of the time? To build a car, you establish requirements. You design it using those requirements. You build the car. You test to see it works. And maybe you do some maintenance once it's out in the world, some oil changes and tires, but like for the most part, you're kind of hoping that the whole thing runs. Easy, right? Why wouldn't software work in the same rigid way? The problem with this philosophy, like so many first ideas, like the Pony Express, is its short-sightedness. What works in one industry does not necessarily work for another. In a few minutes, we'll start to discuss the Agile methodology, much of which focuses on the concept of lean, an idea brought over from Japan's car manufacturers. So here's the difference. The difference is how these ideas were adopted. For Agile, we borrowed. With Waterfall, we just took the whole thing. Waterfall has no iteration, no feedback loop, no structure for movement outside of the specs. Most people know when an organization is not flexible, it spells doom. Waterfall was a doomed philosophy before it even got off the ground. Yet, parts of it are still in use to this day in large-scale corporations. 
So let's talk about Agile. Agile is more modern. It's more widely accepted philosophy in the world of tech. While the world conjures up images that may or may not work alongside the ideals of the philosophy, let's define it before we make any decisions. Agile is an approach to software development under which requirements and solutions evolve through the collaborative effort of self-organizing cross-functional teams and their customers or end users. It advocates adaptive planning, evolutionary development, early delivery, and continual improvement, and it encourages rapid and flexible response to change. That sounds amazing! After Waterfall? Come on. Self-organizing teams? Iterative development? Customer input? What could possibly go wrong? Agile is literally the space age solution. Everything we are looking for is there. Iteration, collaboration, flexibility. At the advent of Agile, which was, believe it or not, during the development of the space shuttles in the 1970s, there was still wasn't much need for adherence to a software development philosophy. Most software was still built in and for large-scale corporations. Computers were not common in the home. Even entertainment systems like ColecoVision and Atari were only coming into being. Agile was a sleepy philosophy for a while. Then, as modern application development and deployment grew in the 1990s, it began to take off. We couldn't just apply the normal manufacturing techniques to building and deploying software. We needed real-world ways that applied to the problem at hand, something modern and different. Agile is an amazing modern workflow, with a few caveats. That really comes from the peripherals. Things like Scrum and Kanban, the add-ons that aren't really necessary and don't really contribute to the success of the team. Agile means flexible. If your team can work without the overhead of complicated necessities like daily stand-ups and raft teams, Agile will probably work for you. As with any philosophy, zealotry and strict adherence stagnates growth. If you need to follow the rules as strictly as possible, that's not very flexible, which is a synonym for Agile. As a great bonus, though, Agile led us to something new. The reason we're all here. DevOps. DevOps is a set of software development practices that combine software development, dev, and information technology operations, ops, to shorten the system's development lifecycle while delivering features, fixes, and updates frequently in close alignment with business objectives. Different disciplines collaborate, making quality everyone's job. Personally, I love this definition. It's a fantastic definition. It's really what other philosophies are striving for as far as how a tech team should function. All the best parts of Agile, the few good ideas from Waterfall, applied to all teams across an organization. Everyone is part of the conversation. Everyone is responsible. This is our modern answer to how to best deliver software. Mobile, web, OS, it doesn't really matter what it is. We've learned from the past, and this is what we have. DevOps, according to Stump, some should be the end of all of development. We introduce the concepts of interaction with developers and ops and IT. We add in QA and testing. It's a great cycle. And, and like, what do we focus on? Automation. DevOps goal, according to some people, is to automate as much as possible to remove risk. I mean, it's, isn't that really what happened to the Pony Express? We needed to get messages to move faster. So instead of doing it manually on horseback, we automated the thing. We built a system that made the old system less useful. Makes one wonder if part of the point of DevOps is to make DevOps unnecessary. Hmm. This is my philosophy phase. Hmm. Like all theories, DevOps is great in theory. Everyone works happily together now because we're all deploying DevOps, right? All problems are resolved and we all get along and the world is at peace and applications work perfectly. DevOps, it works 60% of the time, every time. Like Waterfall and Agile before it, DevOps has one major downfall. It is based on the perfect world idea. In a perfect world, all these things work. When faced with the reality of organizations functioning at modern speed, some of these things tend to fall down. This doesn't mean we should abandon hope, all you who DevOps, but we need to see where philosophies work and where they don't. We need to take our organization's perspective into account to achieve our goals. We need to be critical of things we do and find the parts that don't work. All things in tech should be a constant evolution, not an end goal. Whoever writes software that is done. Beyond our methodologies for how the infrastructure of our team should work, we need to build things. Whether in ops or dev, these ideas come through. And we'll start with a simple idea, test-driven development. This is the concept that everything you build, software or hardware, application or infrastructure or database, must be thoroughly tested before going out into the world. This is a great idea, except that it takes nearly twice as long to build anything. 
Additionally, since you never really know how the people will use it once it goes out in the world, it can be needlessly pedantic. So maybe behavior-driven development is better. Unlike test-driven development, behavior-driven development is based on how users interact with and break the things we do. Forward thinking, right? Let's see how users do things and build what we need based on that information. Brilliant. Less time spent than TDD, right? Well, maybe. You see, it kind of leaves the huge possibility of falling over again and again and again. Luckily for the BDD movement, DevOps culture has been able to adapt and adopt the concepts of chaos engineering, which really help to understand behavior. This is great and behavior-based, so even out of like misguided philosophies, we can pull out some good. What really goes on in the world, in my opinion, in every organization, every team, is a thing called shame-driven development. People only write as many tests as they can get away with so that the next developer doesn't think they skipped it altogether. People only document as much as they possibly can to make it seem like it's working. The ops person only takes their time setting up physical hardware so it seems their time was worth what they want it to be worth. The SRE holds everything together with duct tape and bubble gum, but documents a well-running system. I think you see what I'm getting at. Whether DevOps or Agile or what have you, we generally build things so we won't be shamed by the next person to see it. This is the truth of where most things live in the world of tech today. Kind of like how the Pony Express was built good enough for what the United States needed at the time, we innovate, but we also often, so often we focus on minimal viable product. And think about that, minimal viable setup. Minimal. Viable. Just the language we developed and, and comes with philosophies and ideals that matter to some, but seem to be less and less important as time marches on. Compiled languages versus non-compiled. Open source versus enterprise. Languages like C++ or .NET. We're seeing now a return to functional programming practices while also seeing the growth of JavaScript tools, folks on building single-page web applications, and now JavaScript for the backend. It's a wild and crazy place. These choices lead to things like not needing a proper server, deploying a GitHub page with Jekyll or Middleman or Gatsby JS. You don't even need an ops team, right? These aren't innovations. These are iterations on the same circle of concepts. We aren't building new things. We're just solving the same problems in different ways. And these are all concepts, ideas, but most are based on the ideas of others. What is it like to truly innovate? How do you change an industry that is moving in a certain direction with a certain momentum for so long? When I started my last company, it was the process of two years of consideration, and, and that was on the back of seven years of experience. We were the first developer and community relations as a service company. Now there are a handful of companies that have worked on the same model. I won't say they're the same, but they're competing in the same space. They are iterative, not innovative. The interesting thing about most of the innovation we hear about and see is, is that it's about technology. The Pony Express was about technology, kind of using the resources available, available to complete a task to make humans' lives easier. That's what technology is, building something to make humans' lives easier. Also, it's clear that Pony Express was a bubble, one that burst quite spectacularly. We hear this term regularly in tech and investment, fairly, you know, it's always in the news. The bubble, will it burst? Are we safe? What's happening? We see people getting laid off. We're like, oh no, the bubble. It's hard to tell. We don't really know. We know last time, back in like the late 90s, early 2000s, VC-backed firms fared fairly poorly when compared with bootstrap companies who survived for the most part. But like none of that means anything. None of this stuff matters. Will the new bubble, bubble burst? It's hard to tell. Though it seems like we may have learned something from last time and hopefully we know how to keep our heads above water when things go south. We have more resilience. The issue, however, isn't only resiliency through a bubble burst. It's about playing it safe so we can make sure we rake in that cash. No, sorry, that's not it. That's not the real reason. The issue is innovation. We need to continue to push forward. And I hate to use this word, but it works. We need to disrupt industries as often as possible to ensure we innovate. I know that's cheesy because a lot of people are like, oh, we have to disrupt. And it's a very startup-y word. But like, trust me, disruption is a good concept if it's being applied a little liberally in the marketing campaign. We, can, we can't stop and we won't stop. A lot of companies say they're building the things they need or they build in order to see a better world, but very few can define what that means. Maybe it's something for them, personal, but not expressed. For me, I'd like to see a world with equitable pay for everyone, where people who aren't white males innovate and build awesome things without worrying about being looked at as different or less than. I want to see a tech landscape that is vibrant with ideas. And I'll use my platform to do that as much as I can. Make, as I, can. I need to make that happen. That's just one form of innovation. 
You need to ask what your motivation to innovate is. We strive to keep moving forward. We might be the current Pony Express. Will we last longer? Will we become the telegraph of this generation? When we think of the word innovation, we think of something new, discovering some territory. We've done that by bringing teams together toward a common goal. DevOps has taken us a step further by getting rid of those accoutrements of agile, all the rules and saying, hey, we all have the same goal. Let's work together to reach it, you know? That's innovation. That's riding to outlast the competition. Technology moves fast. We need to learn, adapt, and innovate if we hope to keep up. So we see things come and go. We see innovation built on failure. We see philosophies grow from simple adopted ideas, concept borrowed from somewhere else then retrofilled to our needs. We see that what was the best solution today might be outdated tomorrow and it might happen just that quickly. When adopting DevOps culture and ideals, we seek to find the best solution to our teams and our development in ops environments. We should never accept these ideas blindly. We must question every step of the way. At some point, there was a young man on a horse racing across the hills of California to deliver a message. He never read it. Chances are he didn't even know how. That wasn't his job. His job was to deliver. That message read, Telegraph service reaches San Francisco. Pony Express retired. Every point of our job in tech is to innovate and build. We continue to do so knowing the future is our goal, not the nearby goal, the far-reaching goal. And with that, thank you very much, and I appreciate your time. Oh, hello, BJ. Hello, how are you? I'm fine, and you? Doing well, doing well, can't complain. Cool. So I'm Yulia, and uh, nice to see you. Um, thanks for your exciting and useful talk. Uh, so the way like you changed the tone of your voice, it was impressive, really. <laughs> Very cool. The, the definition voices, yeah, it's one of my specialties. <laughs> Uh, so I have one question for you. Um, what are your assumption? Uh, what will be at its peak uh, this year and what will uh, retire? I'm sorry, say that again. What, um, what are your assumption? Uh, what will be at its peak uh, this year and what will retire? Ooh, this year. Um... So we could talk about my assumptions and and I'm gonna and 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 my hopes and I'll I'll inject each kind of in there. I think this year the the one thing that we'll see more of is I think we're gonna see a huge growth in open source, um, not necessarily in corporate contributions, but what we'll see is a huge growth in uh, people building things uh, that they need because I think that we're gonna see that the community needs to be building things. And not necessarily the corporations are going to need to take them over. And I think that's where we're going to see a lot of innovation, uh, especially in in databases, in asynchronous databases, um, in DevOps tools. I think there's going to be a lot of open source DevOps tools that come out. I think that's that's where we're going to see a lot of a lot of things happen. Um, what do I hope gets retired? JavaScript. I hate it so much. Um, but seriously, I think that the the thing that we'll see go away is kind of that for lack of a better term, that, that kind of fanboy, silly stuff that's been going on the last couple of years, NFTs, Web3, blockchain, these things that were super huge buzzwords, but actually didn't, didn't give us anything helpful. Um, and I know that there's a lot of, it, it's very controversial to say this, but I don't see a lot of value in those things. Like a lot of people are like, oh, you know, we love the blockchain. It could be used to securely move data. And like, yes, that's true, but no one ever did that. It was only ever used for crypto schemes. So that wasn't valuable to people in general. That wasn't valuable to developers, and it wasn't valuable to consumers, and it wasn't valuable to DevOps teams. So who who benefited? Basically the same people that always benefit, rich white guys. So I'm hoping to see, you know, blockchains, NFT, and the concept of Web3 kind of go away because I didn't think they were very innovative and I didn't think they were useful. And I'd like to see the rise of open source and community-based initiatives. Well, okay. Thank you for answer. Um, so now I want to invite you and our participants to the Discord voice chat uh, for communication. So see you there. All right. Thank you so much.